I just want to just want to declare, uh, just put you. Uh, I just want to give you guys a game plan quickly this morning. I like to give you an idea of where we are going so that everybody's on the same page. So the first thing that we are going to do this morning is we are going to talk about the overall vision of our church just for a second. That's the first box. The second box I'm going to talk about is the specific word that I've got for you guys um, throughout this year. Um, it's quite a daunting task to get one word. To carry you through through 12 months of so I but I got something okay I googled and I got something for you okay and after this box we're just going to do a very fancy announcements for you guys just to give you an idea where are we going with this and what you guys can plan and get up to for this year is that fine with you guys you guys ready okay but first before we start I'm going to read a scripture verse we're going to pray and then we're going to jump in my scripture verse is out of 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58 We'll pick it there. I said also. Yes. Okay. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58. And it says the following. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters. I don't know, They just forgot that part. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. I'm going to read that one more time. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. That's the central part that we're going to focus on. Let's pray. We're going to jump into our service this morning. So, Father, I always declare that I'm a broken and limited vessel, Father, and I'm dependent on your anointing to rest upon me. So, Father, even though we're speaking about vision this morning, I'm dependent on you to touch my lips, Father, to touch my mouth so that the words that I speak can be words of power and authority, but not because I have ability, but because your spirit is resting upon these words. So I declare that I'm dependent upon you. Baruch Church, we belong to Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Father, and we we declare our commitment, our faithfulness, our loyalty to you. And we declare that you reign in this building, Father. So whatever happens in this building, may you find it pleasing this morning as our intentions is to do this for your kingdom's sake. We pray that in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Now, some of you have been in our church for some while, and you will always hear we've got this, this, this saying that we always do. Our vision is blessing communities, and our three values is being spirit-led, walking in love, and demonstrating unity. That's this amper rainpi what I said. Some people say it a little bit different, like Ma'am Jenny, being spirit-led, world love, unity, okay? So it's, it's, it's similar, it's similar, but we, we've got the... Ma'am Jenny, here for a um, someone anonymous does it that way. Someone anonymous does it that way. But the point being is it kind of channels to the same direction. And I just want to quickly point out a couple of things for you that's extremely important that you need to understand this aspect of our vision. The first thing I'm going to talk about is ble being a blessing, being a blessing, or the idea of blessing communities. And the verse that I want to show you is out of Ezekiel. And you guys can put that up for me. We're just going to read together quickly. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a spreak from the lofty top of the cedar and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. Verse 23. And on this mountain height of Israel will I plant it. I'm just going to pause right there. Um, for those of you who've been in our church for a couple of, of, of years now, you will pick up on words like mountain. That's quite significant in the text. Now, I don't want to, don't want to explain this to you, but pick up on this word mountain and the reference to a tree. It kind of rewinds back to what we see somewhat in Genesis taking place. But the moment you read about a mountain in the Old Testament, it's extremely significant. It's not just a high place. No, no. It's a place where God dwells. It's like, in our terms, going to church. The mountain is a very holy, very sacred, very special place. So it's serious business where God says He's going to take a piece of this tree and He's going to plant it in a place where He dwells. Okay. Um, on the mountain out of Israel will I plant it that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble seed. And under it will dwell every kind of bird. And in the shade of its branches, birds of every sort will nest. The last one in this section. And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree, and I make, the high, I make high the low tree. 
I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord, I have spoken, and I will do it. Net ingeval iemand onzeker is. Um, just go back to verse 23 again. And um, you know, when we read this, if, if you look, if you look, if you zoom out too much, it feels very judgmental because it is very judgmental. This is a section in Ezekiel where God is p- pouring out quite a lot of judgment. It's kind of a heavy piece. But if we look at what, you see, there's a difference between reading and comprehending. There's a difference, okay? We test this and on school levels all the time. Just because you read something, it doesn't mean you understand something, okay? And the, the central part of, of reading your Bible is to comprehend what you are reading. And sometimes when we read a bit too fast, we only read and we don't comprehend what we read. So I just want to explain, what has this got to do with our overall vision when we speak about blessing community? Simply this, I want to read this section again for you. And on the mountain, mountain height of Israel will I plant it that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. And under it will dwell every kind of bird in the shade of its branches. You see, the tree that grows, the shade and the fruit that it produces, it's not only for its own benefit. We, in a warm sunny day like this, we go to a tree and we sit in the shade, but we aren't the one growing. We aren't the tree. Many times the function of a tree is to be a blessing to someone other than the tree. When I go to a fruit tree and I take the fruit from the tree, it's not the tree that gets the benefit. The tree did the work. The tree was the one who caused the growth. But the one who benefited was a stranger walking past a tree. And God speaks over Israel about this, and this is extended to the church today. And the question is, can we handle that truth? That your blessing is meant for someone else. It's all fun and games talking about church life and going to heaven until God says, pick up your cross and follow me. It's easy to to say, I'm going to heaven, but ask Peter how difficult it is to actually follow Jesus to the cross. And this whole idea of blessing, man, we run to church, I want to give a hundred rand to get a thousand rand. We, we have this mindset, but the whole idea of church is that we are supposed to be the sacrifice for others. It's so different to the culture that we have in church. Because people run after blessings as if pastors of here got magical powers. I, okay, maybe other churches got, I don't, I, I don't. I think bad thoughts in traffic when cars bump into me, and I'm not always list to wake up for work, okay? My kids sometimes is a bit too much, <sighs> but not my wife. She's just wonderful. <laughs> Marriage is a gift from heaven, and you know, it's like walking on sunshine, more like walking on the sun, but you know, sunshine. It's a, it's a unique experience. The point being, the point being, when it comes to these elements, is that we like to cherry pick, cherry pick from the Bible and even in churches, you know? And so, which one is comfortable? Which one is good? Which one is welcoming? I want to ask you which one is challenging you to take a step closer to God? Which one is challenging you out of the Bible? And I'm not even talking about doctrine. Because, man, we can argue about these things. The bottom line is we all speculate about what's standing in. The question is, have you been to a place that's moving you and challenging you to take a step closer to God? That's the challenge. And it goes further where it's not only moving closer to God, but it's becoming more like Jesus and sacrificing for people around you. And it's not easy. It's not easy. If I can, I just want to explain it this to you. Uh, this opened up to me so much when, when, when I opened the cupboard and there was only one chocolate left. Okay? But we are five people in the house. Have you ever had the challenge of dividing a chocolate between five people? You know what's the easiest? Send the kids for a marag sloppy. Tell my wife she can use the computer and I go stand by the pool where I stick chocolate together. It's just, it's just easier. But the challenge is giving what you have worked for for other people. 
forgiving other people that, was, that hurt you. Paying a price for the mistakes of others. It doesn't even sound right. But that's exactly what Jesus did for us. Exactly what Jesus did for us. And this whole idea of this overall vision of, of who we are as a church and who you are belonging to this faith community is this. We challenge ourselves to be a blessing to people around us, even, especially when it costs us a price. That's what we've been called to do as a church. We have a very self-focused church culture in general. It's always based on the wants of people, the desires of people. But the essence of being the church is that it's not about you, but it's about the person next to you. And that's where we struggle with. That's where we battle with, because it's my time. It's my salary, and it is. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not saying that your time is my time or your money is mine. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that we need to shift our mind to say, listen, yeah, God has blessed me with this. How can I be impactful with this? How can I make a difference with this? God has blessed you with lessons in your life that people around you need. God has blessed you with a story that people around you need. And just keeping that for yourself is doing dishonor to what God has put inside of you. Because it was meant to uplift those around you. Blessing communities. It's about being the sacrifice. So that we can exemplify the character of Christ. So that we can be the light and the salt for others. We need to be the shade for people who doesn't have shade. We need to produce the fruit for people that does not have the fruit. And it's these type of topics that makes the church very quiet because it costs us a price. This morning, what we have on the stage, and man, th there's so many people that jumped in behind the scenes. The, the list is too long to mention. For people jump, it costs their time, it costs their effort, it costs their finances. Jumping in to serve a community this morning, it costs someone a price in order to be a blessing to other people. I know this, this point feels like it's, I'm mentioning this a lot, but this is, this is uh, the center. You can't walk away and not get this this morning. Blessing communities, you need to produce the fruit for us. We've got three values, and I just want to touch on them quickly, and then I'm going to share the word with you this morning. Our first value is being spirit-led, and sometimes people confuse this a little bit because when you think about spirit-led, you think about praying and falling over and screaming and running in church. No, no, no. I want to show you a scripture verse quickly. You can put up that verse for me. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that slowly. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You have been blessed with gifts for who? For the common good. It's very interesting. It doesn't even say the church there. It's a part of that. But if you can only serve in church, you are missing what God has put inside of you. If you can't extend what happens here into your week from Monday to Friday, you are missing the function and the gifting that you've got. Your gifting is not limited to this building, but your gifting is to make an impact in the common good, the common area out there. How do you treat the people at your work? How do you use your words? When you're not at church, what does your actions look like? For the common good, being spirit-led means that I don't only preach when I'm up here, but I preach every opportunity that I get when someone asks a question about God. Being spirit-led means that I don't pray when I've got a microphone in my hand, but when I'm walking down the street and you see someone that really needs prayer, you aren't scared to pray. for. I'm not saying that you need to walk around with posts and say, look at me, look at me. No, no, no. I'm talking about being spirit-led. I'm talking about being legitimate. Not superficial, not making a name for yourself. I'm talking about when God speaks, you move. And that's a challenge because our mindset is limited to a building here. And what we do within an hour. But let me tell you, the way you speak to your children at home, it matters. The way you treat your neighbors, it, it matters. It matters. 
Your language use matters. It's element. Your thought patterns, it matters. Not inside this building. It matters especially outside this building. I'm not talking about being fake out there. I'm talking about being legitimate spirit-led where you are God's child outside this building as well as inside this building. And that's the challenge, being spirit-led. That's our first value. The second one is walking in love. You can put up the, the, the next verse for me, please. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It's, it's just a, it's a simple, plain, beautiful verse. You know, if you want to know if God is amongst us, let's see how the way we treat one another. Yeah, it's a bit rough, like, you know. Because stuff happens, you know. Sometimes we don't agree. Sometimes we don't see eye to eye. Sometimes you stepped on my toe. Sometimes you stole my cookie. Whatever. Those things happen. But the bottom line is if you want to evaluate the health of this building, look at the way we treat one another. And this is a very enough point. Because we don't always get along. But it's important if you want to zoom out and get a vision for this year, just look at the way you treat people around you. Sometimes it's easier to treat strangers nicely than the people living in your own home. So instead of trying to be nice when the new people walk in at the church, why don't you be, try to be nice with your own mom for a change when you're at home? Your own dad. Your own brother, your sister, your kids, your family, your in-laws, what, whatever, whatever. Start close. Start close. Get that sorted and we'll sort out the other things. You want to you wanna get a big vision for this year? Focus on the relationships around you. Get that sorted out. And then we focus about the other elements. Okay. This is not a judgmental story at all. This is just encouraging. In demonstrating unity. This one kind of explains itself. I'm going to show you this verse. Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Behold how good and how pleasant it is. Good and pleasant. Good and pleasant is necessary response when you've got unity. If you don't have unity, it can't be good and pleasant. There is more division inside churches than there are outside churches. I, I've, I've, and this is something that I've been speaking about many years ago, so I don't want to repeat that. But the point being is, I'm, I'm just frustrated that uh, I would think that the church would be the leader of speaking about the word unity when we still have separate colored churches. Not because the law says so, but because people want it to be that way. The law has been demolished many years ago in our country, but people still choose. Because there's, it's, it's not that simple. Culture is complicated. We all have our music we listen to. We all have our food that we desire. We all have our language. But the point being is, I would think that the church should be the forerunner of unity. When we are battling with one another... And the world is getting along. So maybe this is just a thought for me. What does your character look like? Is it inclusive? Or is it resisting people? And there's nothing wrong with having church in your language and reading the Bible in your language. That's not what I'm talking about. You guys should, if, you, if you've been here for a while, you know exactly what I mean. Demonstrating unity. Not liking unity or agreeing with unity or believing in unity. No, no. Your actions is demonstrating unity. That's our overall vision of our church. Blessing communities. Being this tree that provides shade for those around us. It's not nice. I can tell you straight it's not nice. But it is part of following Jesus where you are the sacrifice because an expensive price has been paid for you. Following Jesus means that now we become the sacrifice for those around us. Being spirit-led, using our gifting for those around us. Walking in love and demonstrating unity. It's necessary elements to be the church. Now, that's our overall vision. Now, I'm going to jump to our second box, and this is where I want to talk to you about when it comes to the specific word that I've got for the year. But before I touch on that word, I want to read our scripture verse again, break that down, and then we're going to take it from there. You can put up that 1 Corinthians for me, please. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. 
steadfast. If I can explain steadfast for you. I almost want to say a negative term for steadfast is almost like being stubborn. A positive alternative is like perseverance, steadfast, steadfast. You know, my daughter, when she was younger, she got this Wonder Woman costume, okay? But it fit, it fitted. Is that fitted word? Fitted, it it did fit. It did fit when she was three years old. Okay, it was nice and it's comfortable. Don't you judge me. It was nice and beautiful, you know. But she grew in the meantime, and now when she puts it on, there's these small little white bumps that stick out at the back when she's got when she walks around. And then Andre says, "You can't wear that out anymore." She doesn't understand, or she doesn't want to understand this. And so Andre is steadfast in telling her that you will not go out in that dress you can take it on her and wear it at home but you can't go out that way so under is steadfast it's like being very firm in what you do okay so therefore my beloved brothers and sisters be steadfast be firm in what you believe be strong in what you believe the next one it says immovable you know the greek is phenomenal it just means that you can't move okay so the the when you, when you break this down, it, let me put it to you this way. You don't give in to pressure. You don't give in to pressure. Immovable means that waves can hit you, but you are standing firm, even though there's these waves that's pounding against you. Even though that a little bit here and bit there and you look a little bit thinner, but you are immovable. Next one says, always abounding. I want you to think, when you think about abounding, I want you to think of the word abundant, abundant. In other words, there's many, there's many, there's a lot. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. In other words, your, your actions is full of the work of the Lord. Just use that to test your own spiritual life this morning quickly. Be steadfast, immovable, Always abounding in the work. Man, we can't get people to come to church once a week. You know what the challenge is in your life to have an active prayer lifestyle because it costs a price. And Paul comes in and writes, he says, steadfast, immovable, and your actions must be full. Guess what? Circumstances change, but you need to have your faith on a strong foundation because your faith can't change or it shouldn't change because things around us happen. Things change. There's things that's out of our control that we can't manipulate. You can't pay someone. You can't bribe someone. It's stuff that's out of your control. And all I can tell you is that I can't look into the future and tell I would love to tell you that this year you will win the lotto. Okay, I would love to tell you that. I would love to tell you that you are going to pay a 15% tithing to the church after you won the lotto. I would love to say, I, I can't see the future. I don't even know what I'm going to eat this afternoon, to be honest with you guys. Okay, I, I can't see the future, but what I can tell you is whether blessing awaits us or whether challenges awaits, uh, awaits us, our call for this year is to be stable, to be steadfast, to be immovable, to be always abounding in the work of the Lord. That is the charge. No promise of more money. No promise of health. No promise of growth. All there is is just faithfulness and commitment. That's, that's, that's what I've got for you. And then, and then he ends off and he says, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. It's interesting that he says that because he, the reason why he's saying that is because sometimes we feel our labor is in vain. There's nothing more difficult than in to invest in people's lives because you can't always see the impact. When I plant a bean... I can see whether it grows or not. When I preach, I can see the impact that happens in your life. When Auntie Poppy prays secretly at home, there's no signs telling that the prayer is working. There's nothing. There's nothing. There's only commitment. There's only dedication. There's only faith that you get to hold on. Many people give out promises when you come to Christ. I can't give you promises. All I can tell you is that you need to choose. Whether you or your house will serve the Lord. And when you make that choice, you commit to that choice. Because if you are here for blessing, you are missing the entire point. Actually, on the contrary, 
You, you can't serve God to get the blessing. We serve God because He requires us to be the blessing for, for other people. That's a challenge. This, this verse is just, and, and the best way to illustrate this is with this, this one word that I've got for you. It's heartbeat. That's all I've got for you. It's heartbeat. I've got this one simple word for you. You see, as a heart beats, it goes up and down, up and down consistently. But the thing that means life means that it's consistently progressing and it goes up and down consistently. You know what? In life, there is going to be downs. I can guarantee that for you and we're not even going to take up a second offering for that. There's definitely downs. There's definitely ups. But the only thing that gives life is consistently pushing forward. It's the only thing. That if, if there's, I want you, and, and the heartbeat is not really the word, but I want you to see this picture of this heart beating over and over again, but it's continually pushing forward, pushing forward, pushing forward. Even in church, we have bad days. Especially in church, we've got bad days. Because we declare faith. We declare our God can do everything, but suddenly you become sick. And you pray and you believe God can heal you and suddenly no answer comes. But you know what the challenge is? Are you committed to God for the blessing? Or are you committed to God because you trust in His ways and His, His, His guidance in your life? It's challenging. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We're going to use the symbol of this heartbeat throughout this year. And I want you to draw this back to this day now. Anybody can start the new year and say, I want to lose 10 kilograms. And everybody says, I'm going to do it next year or next month, a week later. That, that's the same for me as well. We all do that. But if you, want to, if you want to fix things with God this year, if you want to make your heart right before Him, I want you to think of a heartbeat. Don't be committed only in one week. Don't be committed because there's free coffee at church. Don't be committed because there's two balloons up that is nice and beautiful. Don't be committed because of decor. Don't be committed because of blessing. Be committed because you are pursuing God. That's the only way this year will be different for you. Is if, you if you actually push through the desires that you put in when you started this year. Otherwise, this year is going to end off exactly the same as previous years. Have this heartbeat for God. Have this commitment. And man, if you're not even church, you can use this idea when it comes to your health, when it comes to finances. It's a general principle. All I'm asking you is for once in your life, don't you want to apply it to your relationship with God? Guess what? Next week Sunday, when you wake up, you're probably not going to be in the mood to come to church. Monday evening when we're going to join in our prayer times, you're not going to be in the mood to pray. But we're not, re we're not responding to mood. We are responding to commitment and a decision that we have made in our lives. That's where the breakthrough lies. In. I want to illustrate this for you. Um, I want to illustrate, and this is, a, this is quite a personal story, so I, I'm not sure, um, obviously these elements won't have the same impact for you guys as it's got for me, but I'm going to try to illustrate this to you and um, show you how this functions. Bye, thank you. Perfect. Bye, thank you. Um, yeah. Ach nee, ek gaan op so'n manier sit op die vloer. I want to show you something. Now this, when you, when you look at this guitar, it's a, it's a Ibn S, and don't be, don't be impressed with the name, it's, it's out, it is cheap, okay? It's an it's a extremely cheap guitar. And when people walk past this, this doesn't seem like much. I tried to restring it, and it's so old, this whole bridge section popped out, so you can't use this guitar anymore. It's, it's completely broken. To some of y'all, this, this is nothing. This is just a, just a, a very thin plywood type of, type of boxy guitar. But to me, this has got immense value because there's a story behind this. My dad took a church, his first church that he became the senior pastor of, and the church was at Khansby, Okay, He gets there, 12 people. 
It's amazing. Okay, remember Rain Lakes in Memphis, good Memphis, Cobb Dance. It's amazing. I mean, we, we do, they didn't even call it church. They call it Diskir. It was Diskir. It was basically a steel structure with white walls. And I, I can remember there was this old wooden. Um, um, Ach, what's the word, man? Wendy House. Wendy House at the back. To, to this day, we've been there for three years. I don't think I've ever been in that Wendy House. In any case, you, you have this, way, and this is my dad's church. It's amazing. First time pastor, and, and my dad does what a lot of um, pastors do. They start with connect groups. And man, I know you've been to school in Gesig. Okay, I know you've been to school in Gesig. But you haven't eaten unless you've been to Gans by Pipika's connect group. I'm just, I'm just mentioning that to you. So, because the old ladies, they were competing against one another. And man, we loved every minute. You know, competition is bad, but when it comes to cooking, it's phenomenal. Okay. So, I was, I was a young guy. And, and my dad, because, because, because we are the pastor's kids, he sleeps us some. We don't want to be there, but we have to be there. And the cook, cook sisters is good. And so, we, we rock up at this house. It's, my, my parents stayed in Clan by. And just up the hill, there was a small little house. And a, a guy named there, his name was Ome Henry. And the Tani was Tani Alet. I was young, we walk in there, man, the house is packed, things are going well at the church, and when Henry picks up this guitar, this specific guitar, and he starts playing. It's about three chords that he's playing, and this evening he had a little bit of flu as well, so it comes out very whistly when he's singing, but man, hello, oh, punkster dienster, also and I have one still, okay. And the, the music was so good, if you, if you wiped your hand on the inside of the window, it was almost like, like wet, and moist, you know, that type of church buildings. And then, <laughs> oh, that's a little gross as I know what I'm Any guys, and after, after this, this, this connect group is finished, the people stand up and they walk and they sit at the table and they eat. And, and I was interested in playing guitar. I, I didn't know how to play guitar. I was involved in music, but, but not guitar. And, and I shyly walk up to Omen and I say, Omen, can you please show me just one chord? And on this guitar, he says, of course, but now you know, guys, the adults are sitting one side, Leandra and myself sitting on the other side, like two years and there waiting for a cook sister just because we're too scared to ask. In any case, and, and I can see he wants to be by the adults, and he just said, I will show you something, okay, because he was scared of my dad. In any case, and he sits there, and he shows me this piece, and I'm, I'm struggling, man. My brain is telling my fingers to push this G, but it's not working. It, the, the, it's not happening. I'm telling my fingers to go to place, and it's not happening. And I try to play this G, and I struggle, and I give up. The next week, uh, the, it, 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 it alters from place to place, so every week it was at a different place. But when we pop back by Wumi, and then Tanya Alet, he takes out his guitar, and I ask him, can you show me again? And he shows me, and, and I didn't have a guitar, and this uncle just shows me his three chords that he could play. Thinking nothing of it, showing it to me, going home, whatever, going to church. I was the guy who packed out the chairs or carried my dad's water or catch on nonsense while he was preaching at the bag. You know, I was that, that, that type of well behaved guy. But over the years, I started playing a little bit more comfortably. So, so this guitar to me represents the sacrifice someone else made for me. He passed away. I mean, we, we've been here for many, many years. He passed away, and one day, out of the blue, his wife comes, and she says, she just wants to drop this off for me. And she hands this to me. It's worth absolutely nothing. Okay, you, you, you don't play on these things. It's really old. It's really badly made. But she wanted me to have this because she's moving into a new season of her life. And she dropped this off, and I'm reminded of the effort someone else put in for me and how I, how I struggled. So this represents the start. My dad got um, Barup. He, he, he got bribed to Belleville. And so um, <laughs> he, he, got, he got in, I don't know what Barup is in English. He, he got called, called, he got called over here. And, and one of the first things that my dad bought me was this guitar. Now this is a crafter. It's more, it's better. It's real wood. This is nice and thick. It's a jumbo. So it's got this very orchestra type of feel. And my dad bought this because I can play a little bit now. And what this guitar represents to me, I can recall when he goes to Owataisa, my guitar went with. And I copy and paste what Oum Henry could do net. You know, I don't have the best singing voice, but my dad slept my psalm and Leandro goes psalm. And we play that same song out of E over and over and over again. And we just keep on singing and doing our thing. And eventually it overflowed into church. And I started playing in church on the stage. And then one day I decided that, 
Oh, I'm, I'm not good, but I would like to show other people a little bit about what we can do. And we've got people like Umtubias and Ozaist and Ozwonstel now. And we started on things like Tommy Emmanuel, like a guitar boogie. Yes, we didn't do Amazing Grace. We did guitar boogie. You know? And sitting in our, in our home, and this guitar represents how, it, it represents community. It represents giving a little bit back to people around me. It represents that I can play now, and I don't need someone to show me something, but I am, am independent and I can play. This, this, is, this is what this guitar represents, okay? I'm getting something. Don't, I'm, I'm not, uh, d- d- don't worry, I'm going to get. Then, a couple of years goes past, and things change, and I'm not playing so much, and then this year started, uh, I, I hear a song of a guy named Chet Atkins in 1960, okay? Long before my time, but you guys should know, <laughs> should know when, who that is. In any case, he played 1960, he played the song Windy and Warm, and I just fell in love again. And I went to the guitar store, and I took my wife's money, and I bought me this entry-level guitar. Now, now again, again, we're going cheaper, because uh, uh, you guys didn't pay so much tithing at this church. So uh, we, we're going a little bit cheaper, and I just get a guitar, because I just want to play them. I get home, I start playing, I put it down, and I hear someone fighting. I quickly go to, as I come back, my two boys are fighting one another. And I said, Wat op hier die prachtige aarde? Why are you fighting? I, I keep my voice low when I speak to them. Why are you fighting? And they said something beautiful. They said, because I want to play on the guitar. And AJ says, but I want to play on the guitar. And they're fighting to play on the guitar. This guitar represents me sitting next to my sons. And watching them catch on nonsense on the cheap guitar playing and just Muniz Wart Spieli, Muniz Wart Spieli. Now, let me explain to you what, why, why I'm sharing this with your story. This, this story with you. These guitars represent for me different phases in my life, different progressions in my life. But you know what the glue is in between these, these phases? The glue is simply this consistency consistency it started off horribly it went over to being somewhat that people can listen to and eventually progressed to a place where now i'm using what i'm what i've got and i'm handing that over to someone else so my my own kids that's around me and the difference between these elements is that i just consistently kept doing it i'm not the best out there i don't claim to be amazing all i'm saying is that just because i've been continuing and continuing in this process over the years, now I'm at the stage where I'm adding value to someone else. This would never have happened if it didn't start by Uma Henry that was willing to show me a chord or two. This would never have happened if I gave up and he didn't encourage me to try again and try again. This would never have happened if my dad didn't invest in me and give this for me. It would have never have happened if I stopped because I can't play at church or whatever the reason is. And this guitar would never have happened if that didn't happen. It's, a, it's, a, it's continuing from one phase to another, but the key is commitment in this. That's the key. That's the key. You can't start a journey with God one week. And think you can invest in other people the next week. You can't serve God on the Monday and then next week Friday you choose like I'm going to talk to you on Monday again. It doesn't work like that. The entire journey is about being committed to God through the good times as well as the bad times. And when you push through, you get to a point where your life becomes a blessing to other people. But it can't be a blessing if you stop by the first phase. You can't be a blessing if you stop at the second phase. You can only be a blessing when you commit and when you push through. The Bible talks about maturity, sanctification, holiness. And you know how you get that? By being committed over a long period of time. It's a journey. Your walk with God is a journey. It's not a seasonal thing. But we live in a time where culture influences us so much that we serve God seasonally. Ask anybody that's been on this earth for some time. The only things that's got value at the end of your life 
is the things that you paid an expensive price for and that you were willing to be committed to on the long run. That's the only thing that's going to have value in your life. The only thing. If you want to have a valuable relationship with your kids, you can't throw them away when you're not in the mood for them. You need to push through because the sacrifices is what makes things valuable in the end of your life. The message about the heartbeat is simply this. Push through with your relationship with God this year. It's not going to be easy. You are going to be uncertain. And I can promise you, you're not always going to be in the mood. But instead of trying to be in the mood to serve God, choose to be committed to God in the good times and in the bad times. And when you push through long enough, things become easier. You know why? Because when you already wrote that test and you in grade 12 and you try to help someone in grade 10, you realize, but that's easy. No, 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 it wasn't easy. But because you persevered and pushed through, you become stronger. And suddenly, that which was difficult at one stage in your life, suddenly is so easy that you become the tutor. But you can't become the tutor if you didn't push through that period of time in your life. Stay committed. The essence of following Jesus is to be a blessing. And to be a blessing, you need to be committed during the good and the bad times. And strength will develop in your life so that you can help others around you that are busy with the tests that you have already written in your life.